This is Comcast Local Edition. I'm Jack Hansen. We're here on the USS Hornet because we're celebrating the 35th anniversary of the recovery of Apollo 11, a fantastic event in the course of humankind, as you will. And uh, Dr. Lynn Rothschild is with, tonight, with us again. She's NASA astrobiologist. I have to get all those words in at the same time, an astrobiologist. What is an astrobiologist? Well, astrobiology is the greatest job in the world. What we do is we look at really mankind's three oldest questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going in the future? And are we alone in the universe? But instead of just looking up at the stars and wondering, we take all these tools of modern technology and modern science and, and philosophy and so on as well and apply those to these questions. Yeah. And the thing is that you started as a youngster being interested in science. Absolutely. Right? As, a, as a young girl, you were probably very curious about things and so forth. And that, that curiosity was satisfied because people kept giving you information, I'm assuming. Well, they gave me information and because, yeah. and more, more important is they gave me encouragement. Ah. Um, I was a kid who looked through a microscope in a third grade class one day and just fell in love with the world of microbes. But people didn't laugh at me. My father in particular was very encouraging and my grandfather and so on. And I think that's the most important thing because uh, really a bright kid should be self-directed. They should go out and seek their own knowledge. Okay, now you're also at Stanford, teaching at Stanford. Absolutely. That's right. Yes. And of course you're getting uh, bright, intelligent young people you're working with there. Right. What is your attitude toward the world of science, both men and women? Well, of course the students I get are interested in science or yeah. else they wouldn't be yeah, taking right. that class. But I think that there is less of a tendency to see science as a career and more as a stepping stone to something like medicine and law, which is important too. But I think it's tremendously important that we have really the best creative minds going into science because this is where the discoveries are coming from, doing things that no one else on the planet has never done before. I think it's a mistake to think of science as the way it's taught often in elementary school and high school and so on is coming up with the right answer and that this is something maybe a little boring, not, not a creative field. And in fact, it is tremendously important to get very creative people into the field. Well, this is the thing though, uh, Lynn, because you have to have the right instructors to do that, to bring this information to the youngsters. And there aren't that many qualified people teaching in these areas, it doesn't seem to me. Maybe I'm wrong. No. Especially in the lower grades, you know, in yes. elementary school and middle school and even in high school. You have sort of basic science, and that's as far as it goes. And we need to stimulate those young minds Absolutely. to get into programs like NASA, like the space program, Absolutely. and so forth. Absolutely, you know. and wonderful museums such as this. And this has become a wonderful museum. And I think the people who've come here to, to the Hornet have looked around and seen things they didn't even realize existed. I mean, it's been a number of years since they recovered Absolutely. those Apollo astronauts. And this is opening up some minds, even this week that we've been here. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Tell me about some of the ideas that you have about things that are going on as far as our travel into space. Are we going to be able to do that from a scientist's viewpoint, from a, science, from a viewpoint of uh, biology? Can we do that? Oh, absolutely. We're going to be able to travel in space as humans. And we are already sending up unmanned probes. And many people don't realize this. We also send up satellites and so on carrying microbes to do experiments. My husband and I have been particularly involved in those. In microbes? Tell me yeah. about that. Yeah, well, if you're, Sending them up. Yes. We're sending things to outer space yes. rather than just getting things and bringing them back. Absolutely. And the, the real rationale behind our experiments is the whole question of whether life could transfer from planet to planet. In fact, we know that Mars was actually a better place for life than the Earth when it first formed. So it's quite possible that life jump-started on Mars and then was transported to the Earth, or less likely, but also possible that there was transfer the other way. But if you're going to have life going from, say, Mars to the Earth, it has to be able to survive the voyage. And that's a very big question. We know a great way to take this trip, and that would be to hitch a ride on a meteorite. We know meteorites go from Mars to the Earth. But could a microbe survive within a meteorite during this transport? And so we've been doing some experiments to look to see whether this is possible. Hold that idea and come back okay. and see us again. Okay, Great, Lynn. thank you very much. Comcast Local Edition on the USS Hornet. I'm Jack Hansen. Thanks for watching. 
This is Comcast Local Edition. We are aboard the USS Hornet. It's a floating museum, this wonderful aircraft carrier that has done so much. It has picked up the astronauts from Apollo 11 35 years ago, and this is Splashdown Week, and they're just enjoying themselves all the heck. I have to say that. Dr. Lynn Rothschild is here. She's a NASA, NASA astrobiologist. Nice to have you again, Lynn. Thanks very much, Jeff. All right. Uh, we were talking last time we, uh, we met, and mm -hmm. that was about the fact that some meteorites have come from Mars to Earth, mm -hmm. and some people believe that that may have brought living organisms of some sort to Earth, and other people don't believe that. What's, what is the story on that? Well, I don't know what to believe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure either. But we do know, as you say, that there are meteorites that have come from Mars to Earth. Many of these have been found in the Antarctic. Not that there's anything special about the Antarctic, but of course it's white with snow. You so can see them, right? Absolutely. And there's you one over there, them. right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so we know that rocks can get from there. We do know that the conditions on early Mars were not dissimilar from Earth early Earth, and in fact they may have even been better earlier than um, conditions on the early Earth. So with certain physical and chemical conditions, there's always the possibility that life could arise. So say it arose on Mars very early, and some of it was blasted off the surface um, with a meteorite, maybe something, maybe an asteroid hit Mars hit and knocked and off the surface. Right? right, exactly. Yeah. And we know these things can make it to Earth. Now what if there were microbes on there that survived? then hit Earth, which was a wonderful place to live, as we know, and flourish. In fact, if this is true, it's possible that our ancestry is actually Martian. Life originating on Mars is, a, as they say, a far out concept, right. I think. And but I, it's I interesting. Certainly, yeah. I, I'm not yeah. saying that this is necessarily true, but, possible. but it's, it's certainly within the realm of possibility. Yeah, going back billions of years, who knew? Absolutely. Huh? We're talking about three and a half, four billion years ago. Right, okay. So um, right now we're trying to prove whether or not there has been water or ice on right. Mars. We don't know that for right. sure, do we? Is, is the evidence starting to well, lean in? direction that there's been ice on the on the caps? Of course, we do know that there is there's water ice on Mars. The question really is for life on Earth to get going, we believe that there had to be liquid water for some period of time. Okay, tell me the difference. Ice Well ice, ice of water. course is frozen water. It's solid ah, water. I just learned that. <laughs> You're a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we do know that there are organisms that live in the ice, say in the Antarctic, yeah. but actually they're very, very tiny pockets of liquid water in the ice, which are called fluid inclusions. Yeah. And the microbes live in there. It would be very difficult for them to live and, and certainly to be able to reproduce and so on in solid ice. Uh -huh. Now we know that on Mars, water can exist in two forms. It can exist in a solid form as ice, and that happens, as you say, in the polar caps. And we know that water can exist as water vapor, it's like steam. Right. And in fact, there's a good deal of it in the atmosphere, considering the atmospheric pressure. The problem is there is not enough pressure on the surface of Mars for liquid water, we think. But this is now a very, excuse me, the expression, hot topic. There have been several right. papers in the last few years suggesting ways that liquid water could be stable on the surface. And so this may actually be key to the question of whether there was ever life on Mars. Will we ever really find out until someone steps foot on Mars? I don't know, it's very difficult. Um, the problem is, I'm a, I'm a biologist, I'm a microbiologist, and if I go out and find an indication of life in, say, Yellowstone or outside the right. lab at Moffat right. Field or Stanford, New Zealand, you went to New Zealand. New Zealand, yeah. Antarctic, you're unlikely to question it because yeah. we know there's life all over the place here. So the barrier, the standard that you're going to use for my results is much lower than if uh -huh. I go to Mars or send a robot or whatever and say, we have an indication of life you're going to be much more skeptical. So the standards that you're going to apply to my results are going to be much higher. Okay. So it may take a human there, hopefully not. Okay. Nice to see you, Lynn. Thanks Great so much for being here. Comcast Local Edition, I'm Jack Hansen on the USS Hornet.